Welcome. I'm Olga Segura, the Opinion and Culture Editor at the National Catholic Reporter. Joining me today to discuss the Black prophetic tradition and the latest Pew survey, Black Catholics in America, are Byron Rati and Tia Noel Pratt. Tia Noel Pratt is a sociologist, educator, religion scholar, and an inclusion and diversity specialist. She is the Director of Mission Engagement and Strategic Initiatives and Courtesy Assistant Professor of Sociology at Villanova University. She is also the creator of the Black Catholic Syllabus. Welcome, Tia. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Of course. Thank you for joining me. And Byron is a doctoral candidate in systemic theology at Boston College. His research explores Howard Thurman's mystical theology and anti-Black violence against Black military veterans during the Red Summer of 1919. He received his Master of Divinity from Emory University's Candler School of Theology, a Juris Doctor from the University of South Carolina School of Law, and a Bachelor's Degree in English from Stillman College. Welcome, Byron. Uh, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. I'm very, very excited that you are both joining me to have this really, really important conversation. So I'd like to start with Black Catholics in America. This Pew survey was released on March 15th, and it follows 2021's report on the diversity of Black American religious life. Now, this 22 report is extremely significant. T, I want to start with you. You were a consultant for Pew. You worked with them for four years, and you wrote about this in an essay for NCR titled, Why Pew's New Study on Black Catholicism is Critical for U.S. Church Leaders. Tia, can you talk to me about your work with Pew, including how and why you got involved with this project? Sure. Uh, I became involved with, with this project, as you said, four years ago, even before the, the project officially started. I was invited to Pew to give a presentation to the religion team about my work and specifically about how what they are able to do it as quantitative researchers could be beneficial to qualitative researchers mm -hmm. like myself, uh, mm -hmm. because there there is a, a breadth of of data that that a that Pew with their resources and and their scope can can do that that a qualitative researcher can't do, and so from there I was invited to be a consultant as the as the project got got off the ground and and led to the parent study from last year, uh, faith among uh, Black Americans, and then that led to to last month's report, Black Catholics in America. Thank you, Tia. Um, and one what, one thing that I really appreciated about this report is seeing just this data be gathered in this very groundbreaking way for, for our church, especially at the moment, at the current moment in our church and nation's history. And it was extremely significant for me to see findings like three quarters of Black Catholics say it is essential for them to want to hear priests preach about political issues, including immigration and racism. And one thing that I've really been thinking about since the, the study came out is how Catholic spaces should be using this data and how we can use this data to essentially push our church to sort of unshackle itself from the very public perception of whiteness. So my follow-up question for you is, Tia, what are your hopes in how this data can be used? I really appreciated how in your essay you mentioned when I was a student, when I started doing all of my own research, this would have been so critical in my own work and in my own formation and doing that work. So what hopes do you have to, as to how this should be used going forward, especially for media folks? I think I feel like, and this could just be my own bias as someone in media, but I feel like this is extremely groundbreaking for people mm -hmm. in media. So just how do you think this data should be used? Sure. So there's, there's a lot of question there. So <laughs> let me take it one, one piece at a time. Mm -hmm. So in terms of you know, what I said in the essay about, you know, my, my own work, you know, it, this being a part of this and, and giving, you know, being a, a consultant to Pew every, truly every step of the way uh, was so important and meaningful to me because it means I have had a chance to participate mm -hmm. in the creation of, of data and, and scholarship that I wanted and needed but didn't have 
as a student and, and in the early part of my career. So, so that's just has been just very moving and, and profound for me personally. Uh, in terms of how you know these data can can be used and, and should be used, you know, it just the the part that that you mentioned about what Black Catholics want to hear, you know, when when they're at mass, what is considered essential to their Christian faith. You know, what the Pew report tells us is that this is what folks want, but it also tells us they're not hearing it. And so that's something that our church leaders, be it at the parish level or the diocesan level, should really take into account in terms of how do you structure homilies, how how you structure programming in the diocese and in the parish, because now we have some, some concrete information about what folks are looking for. And so it should lead to the 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 absence and the dismissal of this notion that, well, we don't know why Black folks are leaving the church. Mm -hmm. Well, here's here's some clear information about why Black folks might be leaving the church because they're, they're clearly not getting what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And whether that means that they go to some other church or they stop going to church entirely, what we're seeing here is that folks aren't getting what they're, what they're looking for. And so, you know, these are some, some clear, uh, benchmarks that, mm -hmm. that we can use as we start thinking about what the next 10, 20, 50 years in, in our church looks like. And in terms of media, you know, this is, you know, truly a, a it can be a watershed moment. It can be a watershed moment in, in looking at how uh, Black Catholics are covered, particularly mm -hmm. in, in Catholic media. And, you know, in, in some respects, if Black Catholics are covered at all, and and who does that work, mm -hmm. um, and that that is essential as as well. So, thank you, thank you so much for sharing that, Tia. Um, first of all, I loved hearing just how it was moving just for you, for your own personal faith to kind of just be a part of this throughout throughout the entire process. And I love how you worded it as here are clear benchmarks that folks can use, right? Because we've all heard the excuses, right? Well, we don't know why Black Catholics are leaving. We don't know how to cover Black Catholics. We don't know how to make them stay. And this study feels like a very specific way to be like, actually, we've done the research and here's exactly what Black, ha on top of like the research that all of us are doing in our respective space, here is this very succinct data that's now saying, here's how you should be talking in spaces. Here's how you should be talking from the pulpit. Um, and I want to shift, speaking about this, deepening this understanding of the Black Catholic experience and using this data in particular to, to do that, I want to shift over to, to your work, Byron. You wrote an essay for NCR back in February, I believe. My, my sense of time is kind of all over the place lately, but you wrote an essay for NCR back in February on the, back, on the, Black, Catholic, on the Black prophetic tradition. And it was published weeks before the, the Pew study came out. But it's an essay that I found myself returning to often since sitting with, with the 2022 survey. And one of my favorite lines from the essay, Byron, is, and I quote, Black Christians know deep in their hearts that God cares immensely about Black children, women, and men who suffer under the enduring legacy of chattel slavery and U.S. apartheid and continue to struggle under worldwide systemic racism and white supremacy. The pathos of God for Black lives is the wellspring for the Black prophetic tradition in the U.S. And you describe, end quote, and you describe how this is a tradition that was born, quote, on the shores of, of West Africa. Can you talk to us, Byron, first about this Black prophetic tradition? Yeah, th well, thank you so much for letting me be here, number one. And the, the tradition itself is, is embodied within Black people in Black spaces and Black churches and Black institutions um, that have had to survive uh, as a part of their exist of the the reality of American of existence in the United States and in the Americas in general. Um, I think about it in the sense of the theological uh, tradition itself, um, uh, because that our theological tradition actually helps us to think with uh with god and in god in a, in a certain way the theology is just it's just talk speech about god it's just mm -hmm. god talk mm -hmm. and um all of our god talk all of our theology is 
done. It's always done by humans in history, mm -hmm. um, not some abstraction. And so um, our theology is necessarily um, a great testimony, a great witness, a great prophetic preaching um, mm -hmm. um, out of this uh, sense of relatedness to God in history, in time. And uh, unfortunately, for for um, since the advent of the ch of the chattel slave system and um, the the preparation of the white supremacist thought across the globe, um, people embodied in blackness <laughs> have had to to resist to to resist, and that resistance started with um, on the shores of Africa as we're fighting our way um, to not be enslaved. Um, it it starts on the shores as Black, within the, the slave ship itself, as, as black men and women had to make a decision that just no longer be one tribe or this tribe, but to be a tribe, one people here in America, to lose language, I'm Gullah Geechee. So um, I, I know about just linguistically how we had to create our own languages, create our own ways of being, create mm -hmm. our own uh, literature, our own songs, um, and our own ways of being. One of the uh, lines in, the, in, the, in that article that I wrote, they, people really enjoyed a lot was me saying that swagger itself was, mm -hmm. a, <laughs> was a form of the black pro prophetic tradition. The way we walk in rooms um, mm -hmm. with our hair, sometimes on planes with our hair bonnets, mm -hmm. uh, and that disrupts things. It, it disrupts the way we, we think about civility in airports and, um, or we come in with our African attire or whatever, whatever bring, we bring our gifts, as Sister Theo mm -hmm. would call them. Um, when we bring them in, we're resisting dehumanizing notions about ourselves mm -hmm. and 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 speaking about what how God sees us. God sees us as beloved creatures, people uh, um, that are cared for by God. And and so that tradition is um, being done in any by any means necessary, in, in, in my opinion. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and we see it in the Black Lives Matter movement. We see it in um, other prophetic movements that may not be explicitly tied to the institutional church. And the, what I enjoyed about the survey is that it it kind of showed that the people want the institutional church to, to talk about these issues, to talk about how God actually values black lives and, um, to, and to say that the church believes that black lives matter. And, and the survey goes way beyond just, you know, the issue of race. Uh, it also pointed out that the majority of Black Catholics don't like sexism. <laughs> we don't, you know, that any form of oppression is just not okay um, in the Black Catholic imagination. And so we, um, I, I'm, I'm overjoyed by the survey and, and think that that, to have that data to just show that the theology that seems like I'm making up in my head is really theology that comes out of the Black experience in America. Mm -hmm. and and um, uh, and has validity, um, both qualitatively and uh, quantitatively, in, in the data that the Pew's doing and the data that um, um, Tia does all the time in her research. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Byron. I, I really, as someone who doesn't have a theological background or a very, the official institutional theology degrees that, <laughs> that so many folks in these spaces have, what I really appreciated about how you talk about the Black prophetic tradition is this idea. First of all, I really appreciate the the description of theology as God talk, right? This this um, theology just at its most broken down level is how we talk and think about God. And to contextualize that within the Black resistance that has always been a part of the Black experience in the United States is extremely important because I think that that, and you, you described perfectly what I see both the Pew, the, the survey, your work, Tia's work, what I see all of that is doing is creating new ways of being and showing folks that you can find these new ways of being within the church and connect them to, connect them to things that might be perceived as secular. I really liked how you talked about um, the black prophetic tradition. And you mentioned this is foundational to a lot of the social justice movements that we're seeing now, especially the Black Lives Matter movement. And I think that that is something that, that connection is, I apologies, you guys, my neighbors are doing some construction, so you might be hearing <laughs> that um, in the background. But can you talk a little bit more about how you see that, 
that black prophetic tradition as embodied within a social justice movement like the black lives matter movement especially because i feel like that that connection often feels very very clear to black people in the church and we're all just kind of like this is obviously a movement or many of these movements are trying to build a world where we are not oppressed where people who embody blackness are not um, oppressed in very real day-to-day -day ways so can you just connect that a little bit more for those who are, who are going to be tuning in yeah sure uh, the Easter the the Palm Sunday um, I sing and I canter in church so uh, I always pay attention to the Psalters because I have to sing them <laughs> and uh, the, the the liturgy the 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 Psalter for the um, Palm Sunday um, liturgy was, um, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Mm -hmm. And we'll hear it again on Good Friday. Um, and we'll hear it again on the words of Jesus, on the lips of Jesus as he's on the cross. So mm -hmm. um, when God decided to break into humanity and to to be with us, to tabernacle with us, to, 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 to he, God did that in the most despised of people. He did it among a poor Jewish man who became a criminal. Um, uh, my own state right now is about to execute a man by firing squad um, in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, black, you know, um, that's Jesus. That's mm -hmm. Jesus. You know, that when God enters into history and speaks the, the, the divine part of the God talk, is usually heard in the most marginalized spaces on the margin. That's where God decides to be and to care and to um, and to think. And so, I think for most uh, people oppressed, they they know they can see that the system doesn't care for them. That even sometimes, unfortunately, the institutional church and I want to be clear about the institutional church can sometimes not care for them. Um, our colleague Shani D. Williams has, has shown this with her in recent book, um, Subversive Habits, The Untold Story of Black Catholic um, Nuns, and how the church itself has been complicit in perpetuating uh, the oppression of people who feel called to service within the church, mm -hmm. particularly mm -hmm. black women. So we know what it feels like. We know what this feels like to be on the margins, to be the least among them. And that feeling, that, that sense of care, that's exactly what God felt on the cross when mm -hmm. he said, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And then knows that that abandonment really is not an abandonment. It's really, you know, God being with us in, in the suffering itself and, and saying this is wrong. And the resurrection is the proof of that. The resurrection is the thing that calls us into it. Every liberation movement, anytime you see people fighting against oppression, fighting, God is there with them. God is mm -hmm. there. God cares. God wants us to care. God wants us to get involved. And, and this is, the church teaches this. This is the, the core of Catholic social teaching. The dignity and humanity of all people are, mm -hmm. are being made in the image of God. And, and as images of God, we can reflect God's love and concern and care in the world. And um, I, I, I refuse to not see the Black Lives Matter movement as a part and parcel of the divine work in, in, in humanity and in history. Uh, black women, black women, some of the most marginal, we, we've been having deep conversations about how black women aren't protected, how black women are cared for. Black women decided enough is enough. Enough mm -hmm. is enough. We can't be killed with our impunity. Tra the tr deaths of Trayvon Martin and, and other um, uh, black boys um, is uncalled for. And the death of black women in prisons with, uh, with, without anyone even caring, it's, un it's uncalled for and it's okay. And we care. And so to mm -hmm. just take on that, that, that mantle, um, that, that ethos, that pathos of God to say, I care also, is to, to me is what it means to be a Christian. It's what it means to be more like God. Thank you, and, Byron. And, and unfortunately, there's some people that are more Christ-like outside of the church than there are people in the church. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for, for, for answering um, that question, Byron. Um, and you're absolutely right. I think even just we are, are in year three of the pandemic, right? We're a mm -hmm. few days away from Easter. Um, we just had a an active shooting in in my hometown in Brooklyn in New York so it seems like there's 
constant tragedy and oppression happening around us at all times, right? Um, and we are individually and socially still trying to figure out how to be in community with each other and how to show up at this moment. Um, and the question I have for both of you, I'd, I'd like to start with you, Tia. Um, what, what, where do you see, and, and I will start, I'll preface this by saying this, I, I've been thinking a lot about this question as we head into Easter. We are recording Tuesday of, of Holy Week, and I've been thinking about this sort of juxtaposition that exists within like all of these awful things that we are seeing every single day mm -hmm. happening, juxtaposed mm -hmm. with the fact that there feels like there is an overwhelming amount of amazing Black Catholic scholarship happening at the same time as, mm -hmm. as we are seeing all of the usual devastations we have seen day to day throughout the pandemic, throughout the wars and violence happening around the world. And for me, that has been it has been a difficult sort of contrast to be in, but it's also a very revitalizing space and time for me to be existing with so many brilliant thinkers like the two of you um, in this space. So I wanted to, to start with you, Tia. What do you, what do you think about where we are? And this could be a very kind of loaded question, so I will let you answer it. However, however, however you see fit. Um, but what do you think about the current moment that we are in? as a church um and you know if you want to broaden it to the our church and our nation sister because i think we can't ignore the context of having the second catholic president at this moment but where where do you see our church mm -hmm. right now tia and i want to start with you yeah i mean that's again that's a lot of question mm -hmm. um <laughs> you know where we are as as a church, as as an institutional church in in the U.S., we are are certainly at at a crossroads. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we the the divisions that we see politically in the country are mirrored in the church. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that is that is no accident. Uh, I I don't think we pay enough attention to that. Mm -hmm. uh, as much attention as there is, there there needs to be more, especially the the underlying reasons for that. And then what are we going to do about it? You know, what are we going to do about that as mm -hmm. church? What are our church leaders going to, going to do? Um, and, you know, we're, we're also seeing we're, we're losing our, our churches and schools, uh, especially in, in poor and marginalized communities and in, in our, especially in our large diocese at a precipitous rate, uh, you know, Philadelphia, Baltimore, New York, Chicago. I mean, we we've all seen so many uh, churches and schools close, so much loss uh, of our sacred spaces, and and these are are the spaces where you know to to circle back to to what Byron said. You know where the marginalized are, where where Christ is, where God comes to be amongst humanity, in, in a very particular and essential way. And so to lose those sacred spaces and, and the practical ramifications of that, you know, where were schools, where were places where, you know, those who weren't Catholic encountered the church yeah. and, and encountering the church through school in, in a lot of circumstances decided that the church was where they wanted to be for their expression of faith. And so we're, we're losing that at a precipitous rate, and that's going to have tremendous ramifications as we move forward in, in the coming years and decades, just in, in the, just in the numbers, just in the mm -hmm. numbers and how we are able to, to maintain organizationally uh, is key. Um, so this, this moment that we're in as, as, as a as a spiritual moment, as a temporal moment, as as an organizational moment, there's a lot happening at, mm -hmm. at once, mm -hmm. and and if we don't, you know, look at that, then then we we're going to have ramifications um, that that we can deal with now, but we're are going to be much so much harder to deal with twenty or thirty years down the line. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the 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 Pew report that, that came out last month was focused on, uh, on on Black Catholics, but the parent study that came out last year that focused on, on Blacks in the, in the U.S. more more broadly, you know that that study tells us that 
there are more, more than half of, of our black young adults don't attend religious services on, on a regular basis. I mean, that that is crucial. You know, if, if folks aren't attending now, then, you know, the the likelihood that they're going to attend 20 or 30 years from now, when the people who are in their 40s, 50s, and 60s now are, are 20 and 30 years older, I mean, if they're not, if, if our current generation of young adults are not in, in the pews, then, mm -hmm. then it's going to be incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to, to maintain our, our organization and, safe, and sacred spaces in, in the coming years. Thank you, Tia. Um, and the same question for you, Byron. What, what are your thoughts about our church at, at this moment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I agree so much with much of what Tia said, almost all of what Tia said, actually, um, it, um, it, it's just spot on. I, because, um, so I do theology, but I also do religious studies. And, and when I think, to think about, if we start to think about religion more broadly, um, and, and not just what's being done at mass, uh, the current situation, especially among um, Gen, Gen Zers, and um, I call them Zoomers, but I, I, Z, um, I Zoomer generation, um, what, what they're telling us is that they want a spiritual life and, and they definitely have one, you know, from mm -hmm. teaching them and seeing it's, it's there, you know, but they want a spiritual life that is truly a spiritual lifestyle. It's, it's something that you can live in, that they can live in. And that means like, grabbing from this thought and grabbing from here. Um, the church has a, a, a huge and beautiful meditative um, tradition that we don't use. And so people are doing yoga. Um, uh, the, the, um, there, there's so many other things. And the church has a huge, beautiful social justice and um, tradition and, and teaching that gets um, whittled down into one or two issues and, um, and doesn't focus on the things that are most pressing in the minds of most young people, like the environment, mm -hmm. racism, and mm -hmm. inclusion. And so uh, they, they, they religion, they tie themselves, they, they bind themselves, they find other ways to live out this, mm -hmm. this spiritual lifestyle in, in places that we think are non-religious. And, and if we can build, maintain, um, and even join some of those spaces, we find a place to start to talk to them. No one, Tia just said it, and it was, it's really beautiful. People were able to f come into their first contact with the church in a school. We, we, because of the way we think about Catholic education, of course we think that a school is a religious space. But the parents that were sending those kids, they were sending their kids for a great education. It, yeah. it, was, it didn't really have anything to do with religion, but it had everything with religion. And so we just have to, um, where I see the church, the, the promise that I see in the church is, um, no, we're, we're not going to be able to get everybody back into these seats at mass. That's probably not happening at the rate that we want it to happen. Yeah. But they're mm -hmm. somewhere. And we have to go out. We have to be there with them. We have to bring the gospel into those spaces and then encourage them to come back to the, 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 the sacred space that we do have centered around the Eucharist in particular. Um, so that they can um, get the joy and the, the, the real presence of Christ um, in community and in our sacramental life. Um, but yeah, we need, a, I think we just have to have a, a more expansive notion of where the church will do religion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you both um, for talking with me today, for sharing your research and for just helping people think about new ways of being a Catholic community, new ways of thinking about religion, new ways of thinking about theology. Um, I'm so excited that I will be able to share this conversation and your research with our everyone who tunes in. But before I let both of you go, where can those who tune in to this conversation today, where can they find your work? Where can they follow you guys? Um, I'll start with you, Byron. Any, any sites or social media platforms you would like to plug right now? Sure. My, my Twitter is at Byron D. Rati. That's W-R-A-T-E-E. -E. Um, so, and uh, you can find me there. And of course, I, I sometimes write for NPR and, and other media outlets as well. Great. And for you, Tia? Sure. I'm on Twitter at 
Tia PhD. And I would encourage uh, our viewers to connect with the Black Catholic Syllabus, uh, which can be found at tiapratt.com. And just you know, so many uh, wonderful resources that, that are there for, for those who, who want to engage these themes uh, at a deeper level. Thank you. Thank you to Tia. Thank you to Byron. And thank you for everyone who tuned in and watched today's conversation. For NCR, I'm Olga Segura.